Please give a warm welcome to Frank Porter Johnstown. Thank you, Ed. Just the green button. button. Green button keeps you going. Great, thanks. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And I do know that it's two o'clock on a Friday afternoon. So I know how much you're looking forward to a deep, dark, and dense presentation about the Port of Johnstown. Be not afraid. Sit back, relax. I'm going to take you on a video presentation, or rather, a photo presentation quickly around the new and improved Port of Johnstown. I should add as well that Robert Daly, our general manager, would be here with you today, but he's attending an industry event in Toronto at the moment. So the Port of Johnstown. My family, my mother's family, the De Bruyne family, owned and operated the ferry service between Prescott and Augensburg for 50 years before the bridge was built in September of 1960. And in the advertising for the ferry service during the 40s and 50s, they used to refer to it as being at the crossroads of North America. That was a bit of a stretch. But at the port, we do like to think of ourselves as being at the crossroads. Because as you can see here, you've got the St. Lawrence River flowing by the port underneath the Augensburg Prescott International Bridge, which then leads over County Road 2, across the CN Main Line, across Highway 401, and on to Highway 416, all within a stone's throw of the port. So when you consider Eastern Ontario, the Port of Johnstown literally is at the crossroads. For those of you who are not familiar with the port, it gives you a sense of our facilities. Now, what's important to realize about this is that all of our docks can accommodate any maximum seaway size vessel, 740 feet in length by 78 feet in width, drawing up to 25 or 26 feet, depending on time of year. And as well, the riverfront dock can accommodate two full-size seaway vessels concurrently. So we have a tremendous infrastructure in place to serve clients of virtually any needs. The roots of the port are in grain. This facility was built, and this is the elevator here, the large white building that many of you are familiar with, was built in 1930 under the auspices of C.D. Howe. And its purpose at the time was to facilitate the movement of grain from the lakehead, Fort William and Port Arthur, down through to eastern Canada. Ships at the time, the large Lakers, could only go as far as Johnstown because the St. Lawrence canals covered the rest of the way to Montreal. So 730-foot ships could only come as far as Prescott and 259-foot ships, or Johnstown rather, 259-foot ships would go the rest of the way. So those large Lakers needed to unload at Johnstown and be transshipped and loaded into smaller vessels. Well, that all changed in 1960. Earlier, there was a comment about disruption. Well, the whole business model of the port changed in 1960 when the St. Lawrence Seaway opened, or 59 it actually opened. Because those large Lakers in 59 no longer needed to stop in Johnstown. They all flowed simply down through to Montreal and points east. And the port needed to reinvent itself. It needed to change. It needed to change its focus, and its focus had to become then on eastern Ontario. And it's taken a long time for that change to happen, but I think the port now is in a very good place. What's also interesting is that the time the port was built in the 1930s, right through until the 60s, virtually the entire focus was on wheat. Now, the port with its focus on local markets is primarily focused on soybeans and then as a secondary crop, corn. So the port has certainly made its change in that respect. What all of you will notice through Leeds and Grenville and Eastern Ontario as a whole is that bush is being cleared and planted. Agriculture is a growth story in Eastern Ontario and in Leeds and Grenville. And that growth story is a wonderful thing, but it's led to increased pressure on the port in terms of storage capacity. And so we've responded to that. Historically, we had an elevator that held 120,000 metric tons of storage. Over the last five years, we've added these eight grain bins for an additional 20,000 metric tons of storage. So from that perspective, we're trying to grow with the market, but it does cause constraints at a point in time, as right now, when the harvest is coming in. The other thing we're really focused on is trying to improve efficiency. The port is being run differently than it had been run in the past. It's got a much better customer focus, perhaps, than it may have been when it was run under, for example, the federal government. 
So an example is, historically, the port served farmers on a first-come, first-served basis. So when you took your crop off the field, you hopped in your truck in the middle of the night and drove to the port so that you might be the first truck unloaded. And what that led to was incredible congestion at a point in time, harvest time, that led to trucks being spread all the way down County Road 2. That's changed now to an appointment system. An appointment system, you call in advance and you have a three-hour window in which you'll be unloaded. It spread things out much more effectively, eliminated the congestion, made our customers certainly a lot happier as well. And when you consider in the month of October alone, we booked appointments for 120,000 metric tons of soybeans. It's important that we focus on our efficiency and assist our clients. The port's busy. It's busier than it's ever been since 1960. Approximately 50 vessels a year now visit the port. About half of those are devoted to the salt trade. Another major focus is soybeans and grain. And then we're growing our cargo and break bulk business from there. But about 50 ships annually now use the port. And so from that perspective, one of our key constraints is getting ships in and vessel availability so we can take what's been delivered to the port and distribute it down market so that more storage is available. Now what you're seeing here in this picture is one vessel being loaded with soybeans for export, a second vessel, a sister ship at the harbor front dock, which is awaiting its turn under the loading spouts, and a third ship on the right-hand side of the picture, which is loading, or rather unloading project cargo from foreign markets. Interesting to note that all three of those vessels are serving foreign markets, in one instance importing, two instances exporting, reflecting the changing business of the port. So as the business has changed, we've had to try and move away from simply grain. And the opportunity has come over the last number of years with a new 18-acre riverfront dock. That's been a very important addition for us, and it was made possible by virtue of the fact of a $36 million investment, $12 million from the federal government under their infrastructure program, $12 million from the provincial government, and $12 million from the township of Edwardsburg, Port of Johnstown. That new dock provides all kinds of opportunities for us now to diversify. And again, as I mentioned earlier, it's large enough to handle two maximum size seaway vessels. And here we are unloading structural steel from Spain. The Federal Mackinac, again a foreign ship, has brought that in, and that structural steel will be used in eastern Ontario. Where did that structural steel go before, before we had this dock? It got offloaded either in Montreal, or it got offloaded potentially in Oshawa, and had to be trucked further into eastern Ontario. So the riverfront dock has enabled us to reduce the transportation costs, get things closer to market, and likewise made us a much more effective port for customers in the area. It's also enabled us in terms of not just break bulk cargo, but to move to project cargo. And here we have a picture of a vessel that has unloaded turbines for a wind farm up near Picton. Other examples are all of the cable for the Amherst Island wind project came in by foreign vessel to the port, was offloaded, reloaded onto a barge, and taken up to Amherst Island to be used in that facility. And some of you may remember back a few years ago when the Wolf Island wind project took place. 94 wind towers, towers, fans, turbines, all came in by foreign ship to the port of Ogdensburg because there was no port available on the Canadian side. It was then uh, taken by barge up to Wolf Island. Had we had the riverfront dock available then, all those components likely would have come to Johnstown. So this has been a major, major plus for us. Now, break bulk cargo and project cargo, when they come to us, they don't automatically leave and go directly to market, so you need storage space. So what we created over the last five years are two laydown areas. So if you drive by the port right now, off County Road 2, you'll see structural steel lying, waiting for distribution. That's in the center of this picture. And as well, just in the past number of months, we've expanded the laydown area even further to enhance our ability to draw in more cargo. And in doing that enhancement, we actually have improved an intermodal area, as we would call it. The port is served by a spur from the CN rail line, the main CL ra CN rail line. And so we can now take cargo and potentially move it directly onto rail 
for import into places in eastern Ontario. Or alternatively, if you have a client that's looking to export, can get it to us by rail, we can take it off, put it on the vessel, and export from there. So it's given us significant flexibility in terms of what the port can do in serving its markets. Now, as all of you drove here today, at some point in time, you followed a salt truck. That salt likely came through the port of Johnstown. Here you can see just the volume of salt that came in in 2017. It's interesting that salt comes from Windsor, it comes from Godridge, and this year it came from Egypt and from Chile as well. Virtually all the salt for Eastern Ontario comes in to the port of Johnstown for distribution and use through the different counties. The port is also very open to different business models, and this is important for all of you in economic development as you're talking to potential investors. An example here is a calcium chloride company that came to us and said, what we want to do is lease land on your property and we will build tanks on that land and we'll bring a barge into your port and we will pipe it off that barge into your tanks for subsequent distribution. And so we have that model working within our own model of how we handle things. So we're very open to different ways of doing business and really it's just a matter of conversation in terms of opportunities that you see in your marketplace to talk to us and certainly to Robert Daly at the port. Another distinguishing factor of the port, and one we're very proud of, is our connection to community. The port is, after all, community-owned. It's owned by the township of Edwardsburg Cardinal, by the residents of Edwardsburg Cardinal. Four years ago, the port certainly decided, we've got to develop better relationships with our community, and it started a whole port day. And port day is held in June every year, and with that, the gates are opened. And people flow in of all ages to tour the port, to tour the lands, for a select few, a tour of the elevator. We try to have a vessel there. In this instance, it's a naval vessel, the HMCS Goose Bay. Tours of the naval vessel. People come away with a much better understanding of the port because it's always been something that's been behind the fence. But now it's something that's very much open to the people of Johnstown. And not only to the people of Johnstown and Edwardsburg Cardinal, but to all of you. And we do welcome you and all of your families to come because it is a family day. And it includes a free lunch, which is supplied by Giant Tiger, our neighbor across the road. Here as well, we have another emphasis on community. When the harbor front dock was built, a little bit of money was maintained to put a boardwalk around the riverfront dock. And so that becomes a recreational area that people can walk in the evenings, spectacular view of the port, an even better view of the bridge and of the ships transiting the St. Lawrence right by. Sorry about that. So it's a beautiful spot. And again, reflective of emphasis on community. This is an important slide for all of you, I think, in terms of just the amount of money that's been spent over the last 12 years. If you look at it, $50 million has been invested in this port to modernize it, to make it viable for the long term, to ensure that it's there to serve your customers and to serve your communities. So if you think about that idea of viability, sustainability, efficiency, this is a port that we believe can be here for the long term and it's diversified in such a way that it can serve not just your agricultural markets, but all your markets for those of you who are in economic development. What is that economic impact? There's a study that's been conducted by the ports around the Great Lakes and the Seaway. They employed an independent group to say, well, just what is the impact of marine activity on the Great Lakes and the Seaway? And they did it port by port. And here you can see numbers for the Port of Johnstown. These are direct and indirect. The direct numbers pale in comparison to this number. We employ less than 20 people full time. Our revenues would be under $10 million. But when you look at the indirect impact in terms of what do we influence, what do we create, who benefits, this is, these are the type of numbers generated by the study. And you can see here, 357 jobs influenced by the port. Personal income levels, 20.3 million. $8.6 million in taxes. So when you look at why did the feds and why did the province invest in the port of Johnstown, why did all that money go in? Because of numbers like this and the broader benefit beyond the community of, of Johnstown and Edwardsburg Cardinal, but to all of Eastern Ontario. So what I want you to take away from today then, really it's these few things if you remember nothing else. I mean, certainly first and foremost, Understand that this port is a viable port thanks to the investments that have been made in it for the long term. It's operated sustainably and it will be here to serve all of your clients' needs. 
Second thing is it is an open port. And I talked about earlier being open to ideas, being open to new business models. It's beyond that in terms of openness. Any client can use this port. Any longshoreman can use this port. Any logistics company can use this port. It's not closed in terms of who we allow to use it and what business model is available. So as you have people in economic development that are talking to you about investing in Eastern Ontario and Leeds and Grenville, we're open to any and all ideas on how the Port of Johnstown can facilitate that economic growth. And finally, if you take away only one thing, this is your port. If you think about what facilities are available to you in Leeds and Grenville, this is your port. So don't think about this as being something owned by the Township of Edwardsburg Cardinal. Don't think about it as something that benefits that area just south of 401 down there in the Edwardsburg Industrial Park. No, this is your port. The way I like to look at it is this port is no longer than 90 minutes from any place in Leeds and Granville, even if you're driving slowly. So you can talk to your clients and you can talk to prospective investors about, really, you're only 90 minutes from Europe because it, once it leaves our port, it's gone. So if you think about this as being 90 minutes from Europe, you start to position yourself in a whole different way. So ladies and gentlemen, that's the Port of Johnstown. Thank you for the opportunity to portray it for you.